I originally wanted to be a painter, but slowly photography became more fascinating. This was in the 1960s still, and it seemed like there was a direction for me in that medium. And I did go to some museums, including the Prado, and so the impact and the beauty of paintings by Bruegel or Manet or Velasquez somehow stayed with me as a background to what was going on in contemporary art. And so it occurred to me that photography could be larger, it could be in color, it could be at the scale of the human body, but also at the scale of painting. But of course that means you must make a photographic print at a larger size, uh, obviously. Let's call it two meters by three meters, or three meters by four meters, or whatever it happens to be. To make photographs that could hang on walls of rooms the way that paintings had previously hung, and that could not imitate painting, but come into a relationship with painting that was um, going somewhere. Photography always claims, or has traditionally claimed, to represent something actual. And many people have questioned whether it ever shows us the truth. And so I thought at the very beginning that all my different directions would all be connected by means of working with that claim, working with that truth claim, but never in the same way. I had the extremely artificial pictures that would make no claim to truth. I had straight photography, like landscapes, that would make the very traditional claim that they were as truthful as any other photographs in the history of photography. And then in the middle also were what I considered my purely cinematographic pictures in which more or less truthful performances could be recorded, like in a good film. I tried to elaborate each of those directions somehow by moving between them. I always felt if I looked at Manet or Delacroix that it was almost contemporary. And so my first pictures, like The Destroyed Room, really emerged from a kind of re-encounter with 19th century art. This picture was done somehow as a response to my experience of the Delacroix painting from which I derived the composition, that is, The Death of Sardanapalus, which I had seen a few years before. The whole little room was fabricated in a studio, and uh, very roughly fabricated, because at that time I wanted to make it clear that this was not a real room. This was only an assemblage of some kind that would signify the presence of a room. But through the door you can see that it's only a set held up by supports, that clearly this is not a real space, this is no one's house. Through the window you can see the other windows of the building that it's in, and I felt that was making obvious the complete artifice of the whole project. And um, it had to do with violence, obviously kind of sumptuous spectacle of violence that seemed contemporary. This was in the 70s. And the scenographic idea of photography, which was done extremely crudely there, seemed one of the artistic possibilities. When I thought I would work in color, um, I realized at a certain point that I had been noticing these illuminated pictures that were around in airport and other places for advertising. It's a very common technology, a very common industrial product, in fact. And I thought, uh, for all those reasons, that I should use it, that it was a medium that hadn't been really exploited and understood as a aesthetic phenomenon, and it could really go somewhere. It was also seen to be an excellent medium to work on a large scale. So that was my main reason for wanting to use a light box. A photograph is a transparency, that is, the same as a slide, and that's placed in the light box with a white material behind the photograph that makes it impossible to see through. And behind the white material inside the frame are lights. And the lights shine onto the white material, which shines then through the photograph. And you see only this brightly illuminated picture. Most of the time, my pictures are done in collaboration with performers to connect back with what painters did, which was to collaborate with their models. So 
in many of my pictures where you have the feeling that something is happening, you are in fact witnessing the results of a performance. My view is that it's more interesting to look at the picture as a representation than to look at the event as an event. A journalist is interested in conveying the event to the viewer or reader. The artist is interested in conveying the representation of the event to the viewer. I think all pictures work in a kind of play between these two possibilities, that it's simply a fragment or it's a microcosmos. And more and more I think that the pictures are also about maintaining a certain invisibility for things. And you might make a picture that contains both what it shows and what it excludes. The most obvious picture in which the idea of the invisible or the disappearing part makes itself evident is probably restoration. For the simple reason that the picture was designed to be made with a panorama camera that is a moving lens camera. And I set the camera to take 180 degrees of a 360 degree space because it's a round building. The picture shows you exactly half, not 179 degrees, but 180 degrees. And there's a part that disappears behind the picture edges. So the exclusion of the space behind the camera is measured in a way that no other picture I've made is so closely measured. And so that's a good technical example of a picture that includes by means of its structure the excluded space. And of course there's a woman looking into the space. Into part of the picture you can't see. To make a little accent to that notion that there's a space outside. I knew in 83 or 84 that the digital image was coming and that uh, there was something I could do with it. And that it was going to change our relation to photography in many ways that we can't define. And so then a, a new door kind of opened, which was the idea of photomontage. Dead Troops Talk was the second picture I did with a digital technology. I wanted to make a picture in which soldiers who had been killed in battle in a fantasy woke up again and carried on a conversation. I felt that this idea of the dialogue of the dead was something fascinating. The Afghanistan war was going on at the time. I decided to do it as the Soviet patrol in Afghanistan. So I had to build a picture from the earth up. I had to get a studio, a big studio, and build an enormous structure, and then cover that structure with earth, and imitate pretty much the low mountainous geography of Afghanistan. Then there was the event, the nature of the event, which was going to be the waking up of the soldiers. So I had to make a composition where, that would allow you to see them all properly, and I, I had to really compose this the way a painter would compose a painting. And then I shot it uh, piece by piece. So I would bring one actor into the studio and just concentrate on him, uh, or two, like this pair. Obviously, they had to be shot together. All of the pieces were scanned and made into digital information, and they were all assembled in my computer studio as a kind of uh, electronic montage. And of course, with that kind of montage, you can't see any of the joins. So it's perfect illusion. So some are like this guy, he's in a state of rage and panic and despair. And the guy next to him is just contemplating his panic but he's not experiencing any panic himself. And this young man who's, you know, been so badly wounded, who's the main, in a way, the main character, the storyteller, in a way, is, is trying to say something. And he's talking to the captain, who's simply contemplating him from a great distance, as if the question is coming from an infinitely far space. And other people are, you know, these are three characters at the top are clowning is a kind of a grand guignol comedy that I wanted to put in because I didn't want the picture to be too serious because if it would be too serious, I would feel it would be monotonous and in the end would be pompous.
I needed to have something ugly, stupid, grotesque, and somehow correct. And I think that my work always had that grotesque quality from the very beginning. The grotesque is also something to do with what I consider, what I call the spectral. That is, where we have specters, ghosts, imaginary characters who also coexist with real people. And the grotesque is the moment of that coexistence. When I'm shooting, sometimes I use video for rehearsing the actors, for establishing basic positions and the relation between any movements they need to make or point at which I want to photograph them. But it's a very useful and quick means to look at the relation between movement and stillness, because in all the pictures that I do involve movement, but I want to be able to some way predict and control aspects of that movement. Ready, set, action. Ready, set, action. I think the idea that an artist expresses a point of view is maybe not entirely true. I think Nietzsche said that a, the true dramatist speaks out of many masks and that he has, in fact, no point of view, necessarily. And I like the idea of creating characters who do not embody my point of view, but simply that I was able to make visible. And that each of those characters, I hope, has some kind of autonomous existence aside from what I happen to think. In Picture for Women, and in all of my pictures that are a certain size, the picture will have to be printed on two separate pieces of film. And the two pieces of transparency will have to be joined together, usually with a piece of clear tape. And where the two join, they slightly overlap, and it makes a black, almost black line. And you can see that line in the actual picture. But the cut, the join between the two pictures, brings your eye up to the surface again, and creates a dialectic that I always enjoyed and learned from painting, which is that all pictures are a dialectic between depth and flatness. I still think about where the cut should go and, in a way, how it relates to the overall picture. Sometimes I hide it, sometimes I don't. For example, in A Sudden Gust of Wind, which I made much later, the feature of the picture is the sky with the papers blowing in it. But the seam line has to go right through the sky. So it's an ugly interruption with a black horizontal line going across the beautiful sky. But I like that. You know, we learn from all of modern art, from Picasso and everybody, that a moment of ugliness is always important. So I've learned to like all these material limitations. We need them. <laughs> 